This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 442 for Thursday, May 12th, 2022. My name is Joel Duggan and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we're into. Boy, do we have some geeky stuff to talk about today. This week, Alistair McFly is back. You can find him at Alistair McFly on all the social media that matters and on Twitch where he chuckles just like that. Hello, sir. <laughs> Hello there. Hello. Yes, geeky stuff is, is, definitely, uh, is definitely true. I have a compliment to pass on to you, actually, from uh, our, our friend Johnny uh, Pixelriffs, who does the Spawn Chunks podcast with me. Uh, we were talking about the Citadel Cafe in the render distance on this week's uh, extended version of the Spawn Chunks. And he said that he rather enjoys that you are like my Star Trek correspondent <laughs> that comes on the show whenever we got a lot of Star Trek news to talk about. So heads up, folks, uh, we are going to be talking about Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Strange New Worlds later on in the show. Uh, shortly, actually, we're not going to be delaying that too much. Uh, spoilers ahead. I uh, will warn you again when we get to it, but like it's going to be hard to talk about this stuff without talking about the, the cool moments and stuff in detail. So uh, just a heads up mm. that th that is what is coming. And I want to get this out of the way first before i even ask alistair how he's doing which is a misstep i realized i just made <laughs> um i just needed to, to get the negativity out before it it sprinkles itself in and amongst the the review of the shows we're going to talk about i've had to watch the shows on crave and i've talked mm -hmm. about the low stream quality on crave before uh i have since unsubscribed to crave uh, they were no longer getting any more of my money. I don't care what they have to air. I am telling you now, I will find another way to watch it. I will find another way to watch it. There are ways I can even pay to watch it that are cheaper than the $22 Canadian a month for Crave. And the thing that really twists me is that these Star Trek shows that I'm watching are potentially beautiful. They probably look pretty good. And my television does okay at, at upscaling 1080p content. It's a 4K TV, but 1080p doesn't look terrible on it, except for stuff on Crave. Not only is the picture compressed and, and has a lot of artifacts going on, there's also this like, I don't know how to, it's like a bumper car camera move that happens every single time the camera moves, which in a sci-fi show, whenever they're showing a sweep of a starship or a planet, or I don't know, panning across the bridge to different members of the crew, the camera stutters. And it takes me out of it every single time. Anyway, I'm done. The fact that these two um, shows that I'm really enjoying are not something that I can visually enjoy as an artist. And I mean, like, we'll get into the stuff about Strange New Worlds because that's a pretty show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To, to have that taken from me by the only service that I can watch this on in Canada, uh, Paramount Plus has advertisements everywhere for all this wonderful Star Trek content, and I can't watch it on Paramount Plus. I watched Halo on Paramount Plus, but Bell, which owns Crave, uh, has the rights to the new Star Trek stuff in Canada. And I'm telling Paramount right now, because they're listing, they're not, uh, <laughs> that i'm i'm not able to watch your shows because of the shit stream coming from from craven bell now as alistair and i were talking about in the pre-show i will note that it is i am on a roku tv and i believe that the roku app the crave app on the roku tv is not as up to date as it might be on other set top access uh, smart tvs whether that's a box or whether that's built into your tv because with mine, the the quality is, is fantastic, but for the setup that you have, the fact that their app for that Roku obviously isn't built to provide the kind of quality that you're paying for, that they are able to get elsewhere is... And that's it, the thing. It, it's if, tough. Yeah. If you've got massive shows, huge franchises, Star Trek is massive. 
and you've got this brand mm-hmm. new series that is kicking ass and <laughs> you don't have the like you can't get your app up to 2022 standards like i don't know why i put three twos in there but you know what i mean uh it, it's it's just it's just frustrating and so i'm done i've as of june 6th a uh, crave ticked over this month and they billed me and i was just like well that's that's it you're not getting any more any more money out of me <laughs> well we'll tell you what i i'm i'm still paying for it if you want to watch it for free come over to my place you there can we watch go decent quality we're gonna hang there out you go. that's we're it hang yeah out. there yeah, we win yeah and then they don't and yeah yeah well, they win out half creating, <laughs> they win out half <laughs> creating friends creating <laughs> quality time between star trek <laughs> friends it's all about friendship. We're come full circle back to back to Star Trek. Anyway, that's my that's my rant. I am I'm telling people now, just don't bother. If you think you if you're enjoying the conversation that Alistair and I have later on in this episode, and you think, man, these shows sound good. I'd like to check them out. Find another freaking way if you're in Canada. Just don't. Don't watch <laughs> it on on Crave. Um, or if you get a free trial, try the free trial and then quit immediately. Like don't let them bill you because it's 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 awful i mean there's a chance that it might look good on your set but you know like i and part of it too like i understand that they the bottleneck is like the app and the apps are not all created equal and all that kind of stuff but like as someone that saved up and spent a lot of money on a new tv and an xbox you know and by the way i'm watching it on the tv not on the xbox but you know to spend that kind of money on on two devices and, and add to your living room and then have it look like that it like it is infuriating like that kind of money usually begets a very seamless you know presentation and i've had that experience whenever i've watched anything on disney plus like the marvel series you know whenever i watch the star wars animated stuff or anything like that that's beautiful it looks great mm. i rewatched one of the avengers movies a little while ago it looks fantastic you know um so there it's the tv is capable it's it's the um, it's the app. It's the other yeah. bottleneck. Yeah, it's the streaming services and the, and the app. Um, I did think, you know what, Joel? Maybe it's time to just give up and and go to the iMac. You know, go to the computer, go to the desktop. It's wired in, and go to the Crave website where it streams in 720p because it's 2011. Apparently, it's gonna. It's definitely gonna be down to where most and how most people are watching it and where they'll they'll divvy up their developer time uh, i am sure that that's a, a lot to do with it but yeah divvy better yeah unless you're looking at, at purchasing another set top box to do this and investing further into that yeah uh, then no. yeah it's <laughs> for, for the setup you currently have that's where it's problematic yeah uh, like i said I, i've i've had a, a wonderful experience with it but i have a different setup so what is new with you now that that is out of my system and we can move on, <laughs> we can, we can just, you know, rubber earlobes and just like move on to the to new plane of existence. What's, what's up with you, man? Oh, I, I have been delving into the recesses of my memory to just grasp onto some old nostalgia. Uh, I don't know. It's one of those things that's kind of been at the back of my mind, partly because I've been going through a lot of stuff with the Game Boys and, and doing restorations. I've, I finished the restoration of my first Game Boy, uh, which is now looking beautiful. You sent me pictures. It looks very, very, very cool. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's getting me even more hyped to, to continue on with that. Uh, but in the back of my mind, I've also been thinking back to an old console that I had. It was a Pong console. So this is from 1977. I'm not that old, but uh, <laughs> we, we had one. <laughs> It was my first console, and I, I've and trying to find it because there were many of these things. That all sorts of different companies were making them, and then you had companies like Magnavox with the Magnavox Odyssey series of them, where they made a ton of those Pong machines, and then they would license out that tech. So other companies were just using the same hardware, just in a different shell. After going through all sorts of websites and looking at all sorts of photos, I finally managed to find the one that I had, and it was a Radofin Telesports. And it is beautiful in terms of just the, the aesthetic for it. It's got a massive dial right in the middle, and it's got Pong, six variations of Pong. So there's like tennis, there's squash, there's football, and so on. And there's these wonderful 70s style flip switches, which look like they're off the bridge of the Enterprise. And then the controllers have these little dials just to move the paddles and things. And this was before you had cartridges. 
there was no software running. There wasn't code. It was all done just through the circuitry, which is why these switches are what you would use to change the, the difficulty for it. It's funny how, I'm going to say futuristic it looks, even though yeah. it's from 50 years ago, 45. <laughs> One of the places where my sister and I used to go after school, it was a neighborhood home that looked after a bunch of kids like between 3 and 5 p.m. And they had an Atari. So there wasn't this. This is this is something different. But it was it had a similar sort of vibe. Like the Atari had like a joystick with an orange button. It had the black kind of console thing. And then yep. there was also the the dials. Like there was a dial. There was two mm. dial controls as well. And I remember Pong and Pitfall and a couple of other things that, that we played. Um, but I think the dials were used for... Is it Asteroids? Is that the one that as a, as a as a stand up cabinet in in an arcade, it would be like a rollerball that you would use in the middle? Yeah, I think that was how yep. that worked. Yeah, it'd be either uh, asteroids or missile command. Uh, uh, one of my Atari um, uh, arcade one up cabinets is exactly that with the rollerball. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so that's that's yeah. what it was. Yeah. yeah, this is really so. So this is yours. You own this, or is this just a picture? Of yeah, it? that's that's the, the picture that um, that I send you is the one that I bought on eBay. I bought it for eight pounds ninety five, which works out at around fourteen dollars Canadian, <laughs> and it was fifty eight dollars shipping. Uh, yeah, no, I was about to say, and you had to bring it over from the UK, which means it cost you an arm and a leg. Yeah. Now, I don't have to worry about the power supply differences because it runs on batteries. These things didn't often ship with the power supply. That was optional. And it's going to... So I'm going to have to buy D-cell batteries for it. I've also had to buy an RF to HDMI adapter. And so that's going to be fun to see if I can even plug it into anything. But there was just something about the nostalgia in me that was wanting me to, to play this again. I kept sending a few photos to my father going, was this the one? Could it have been this one? There was another one that was like a Binatone uh, branded one. And uh, my father was like, oh, it looks like it might be. I'm not sure. I sent him this one. And the moment I saw the controllers, it's like, this is 100% it. This is it. Do you remember this one? And he goes, I remember it was better without sound. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would drive you crazy <laughs> yeah well because i remember that from when brockett and i were talking about the super nintendo stuff uh a couple weeks ago and my mother used to just constantly tell us to turn down the super nintendo because <laughs> it it like mario kart was fine super mario was fine because it had music and stuff but like the street fighter 2 it was nothing but whatever sound bite bit 16 bit sound bite they had for whatever special move you know you'd, you'd have you'd have you know ryu on one side going hadouken hadouken and you'd somebody else you know like chun li making some ka -ka -ka, you know kind of strange high-pitched noise constantly right just back and forth and back and forth the mom would just be like <laughs> shut it off turn it down or shut it off <laughs> just like yeah you see the vein in her they, forehead they, they don't throbbing. understand you need the sound it's not the same and uh, to that note the, this is one of the things where I, I needed to get the exact same one. It wasn't just, you know, I want the one uh, as a child. The sound is there. I'm, I'm, I'm remembering the sound from my memory. And I know that even if I got something that was similar and close enough, the sound would be enough to just go, this isn't right. Yeah. And I'm kind of, I'm chasing that bit of the nostalgia, I think. So you haven't been able to hook this up yet. You're just in the process of, of restoring I, of it? Of waiting. I'm waiting for it to be delivered. Oh, you haven't, I, been, I haven't only, delivered it. Okay. No, I only I only bought it like two days ago. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I was I was the only person bidding on it, so it was an easy win. I mean, <laughs> yeah, surprising. I wasn't expecting to be in a massive I'm, bidding war with people for this, but I'm surprised stuff like this is still around. You know, and people yeah. still have them. You know, uh, to even sell on eBay, it's because uh, I mean, the, the, some things that you kind of think, yeah, okay, like somebody that bought a camera, like a DSL camera from. 10 years ago like they probably still have that so you see those on ebay or, or facebook marketplace all the time um yeah. but but for something as old as this i mean that's really cool it's really really interesting you might have to go find yourself a crtv <laughs> oh <laughs> i i t tell you i was i was in dartmouth today at uh, the lost world which by the way they've got a lot of star wars uh, lego sets all discontinued ones you oh, might do they? check that out oh, okay oh, yeah. yeah i walk by there all the time yeah, they've got like Poe Dameron's X-Wing uh, that's like $150. Oh, 
Oh, okay. So, so still a bit pricey, but mm-hmm. they, they do have a selection of stuff in there. And they, they had a CRT TV on the floor. And I'm just like, I'm not even going to check whether that's actually for sale or not, because uh, I don't know where I would put it. <laughs> you know what, though? <laughs> like, I'll, I'll see if I can hook it up to HDMI, and then I'll look at CRT. If you're looking for something that old, there's a pawn shop up the street. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yep. that would make sense. Towards yep. the harbor, yep. there's a pawn, there's a pawn shop up the street. I have maybe ever been in once, once dropping some stuff off, but <laughs> but uh, so I don't, I'm assuming it's still there. I imagine they're still there, um, but uh, yeah, there's 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 ways to pick up a CRT TV uh, still these days, which is surprising to me. To me, um, mm. I even I even dread getting out my old like flat TV just to kind of like hook up to another computer, just like t- just to have a monitor, you know, because my other monitors are all being used. So it's, uh, yeah, digging into the old tech, like sometimes we think, yeah, sure. Like I'd love to see if I still have my old super Nintendo. And I think like, how bad is that going to look on a 4k television? <laughs> right? Like it's <laughs> probably not great. I mean, Mario yeah. might look okay. Cause it's pixelated and you're kind of remembering it pixelated, but, but Mario Kart is going to look awful with all the, like the polygons and stuff. Part of the thing as well is that a lot of the games were made with CRTs in mind, uh, the, especially when you look at games like Sonic the Hedgehog, where they would do like translucent waterfalls, it looks like just grid lines on a modern display because they right. were using the fact that CRT was horrible and it would shake, that they could do this kind of interlaced pattern and then it would look transparent. Right. So unless you're using some form of CRT filter and it's a good one, mm. uh, then you don't quite get the same effect because you've lost the the nuances that the developers were playing into well from the past to the future we should move into the main discussion this week with uh, both shows we're going to be talking about star trek picard season two which just wrapped up this past week uh and star trek strange new worlds which has not one but two episodes out i just watched the second one over dinner tonight so fresh in my brain uh, and I don't know exactly how far in the future we're going. So that's why I have you here, uh, which okay. is, which is going to be <laughs> beneficial, I think, but I don't have a lot to say about Picard. Um, so do you want to start there? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes the most sense. So I actually ended up binge watching this because I found that around episode three or four, whenever they ended up, uh, changing the timeline, maybe that was episode two. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they go back in time, I found that it started to get slow like real slow. Uh, yeah. The character interactions became better sometimes, but I found that it got, it got very, very slow. And uh, it's not like I don't like it. It just, I felt like it needed to pick up the pace, um, which it eventually did as things started to unfold. And it became more of a, I don't even sure what you want to call it. It reminded me of not the away missions, but the, um, the holodeck episodes from Star Trek, the next generation when they like would go to like a Western town or there would be like, I, insert any kind of like holodeck experience that you remember from that series. And that's what this felt like. Like it felt like you've got all these savvy Star Trek feature people that are back in the t- 2024 or something like that. Um, roughly now they just didn't want to do right now. Um, and so you had a, a lot of, I guess, interesting relatability, which was nice because it removed a lot of the technology that the characters were able to use. Uh, and then you ended up having, they had to do a lot of things the old fashioned way, you know, driving cars, uh, hunting down information mm. with the internet. Um, there is, I don't remember her name right off the top of my head, but um, the um, actress that played uh, the nurse, no doctor, the, the physician uh, and love interest of um, the captain um, Rios. Uh, she yes. was, she yeah. was really good. She added a lot of heart. I thought, to to the show uh and uh dr teresa ramirez uh sol rodriguez is her name she was great i really i really enjoyed her she was very matter of fact they did a really good balancing job between like her being feminine and and a love interest you know for rios but then also just like take no bullshit (laughs) sort of stuff (laughs) um i and something else i really enjoy about picard is that they'll swear in the show which i'm not used to in star trek I mean, we get it in the films from time to time and it's always there for a laugh, you know, but in this show, it's pretty good. Yeah, we, we have had it in, in a few places, even in Next Generation. 
a which, lot of people which forget. Which is where, that, really where it gets a laugh, right? Because, of course, there was no swearing on TV with TNG, right? It's main t- mainstream television. Yeah, but but we've had Riker do it. Uh, we've had Picard swear in French mm-hmm. as well. Uh, you know, So it's it's not like swearing has never been there. Uh, I, there wasn't any on the original series for obvious reasons, but but yeah, it's been there. But they're they're playing into it a lot more, and it's really kind of helping, especially with Picard, bring out a lot of the anger and frustrations. Like when Hughes, then he's just like, "I am done with your bullshit." Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, it's like you know, you, you can feel that that's exactly how you would be at that point after what thirty years. Yes. Of Q's meddling. Oh, man. Yeah. And that's how I feel about Q in episode one of The Next Generation. So when Picard tells him off, I am just like 110% right there with him. Because every time <laughs> Q had an episode in TNG, I was like, oh, God, really? Do I have to watch this shit again? Uh, I've never I've never liked the Q episodes. I've always found them pedantic and... You know, like there's there's something that happens that's, you know, usually, you know, interesting with one of the other characters. But I just uh, Q, I mean, and rightly so. Q is supposed to make your skin crawl like you're not supposed to like him. You know, you're not mm. supposed to like your interaction with him. You're supposed to feel the same frustration that the rest of the crew feels, which I did um, in that show. Although I will say that as someone that is not a Q fan, uh, I thought they handled this very well. Uh, in terms yeah. of Q's last appearance in the Star Trek universe, in terms of the why, which is what we all wanted to know, right? Was why the hell does Q keep on messing with Picard? And yeah. in true Star Trek form, it boils down to Q's lonely. Yeah. And it's like we've had Q meddle with Cisco on Deep Space Nine, but that's because he was traveling with Vash who was a romantic uh, 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 person in, in Picard's life. Uh, so he left with, uh, with Vash, he left Picard with Vash, ends up on Deep Space Nine with Cisco, and then he's there with Captain Janeway in the Delta Quadrant because humans shouldn't be in the Delta Quadrant at that point of their development. So for him, it's like, what the hell's going on here? So it kind of makes sense as to why he's there so briefly on those other shows. But to your point, he keeps coming back to Picard repeatedly. Yeah. Uh, so. Do you, do we know what Q is? Like, I know he's an alien slash entity deity almost. Um, but uh, has there so, ever yeah. been any, I mean, I know he's part of the Q continuum. Like I know all that yeah. stuff, but like, is there any, ever been any inside baseball as to what he actually is? Just that he's an omnipotent being, and we're taking his word that he's omnipotent. Right. Uh, we know that for some reason he's able to die. We know that there's been another Q that was in Voyager that committed suicide, which okay. was considered like heresy, <laughs> you know, to, to do so. Right. Uh, but they are capable of death. It's something that we, we do know. Yeah, they're not immortal, but, apparently. Hmm. Yeah. And, and they, you know, what they are hasn't really been explained too much because they they basically just consider themselves like gods like that's the closest analogy that they can come up with and i think it's because even the concept of what the continuum is is difficult to comprehend Mm -hmm. or write about depending on (laughs) which side of the the fence you're looking at the show from they did a good job of keeping it relatively simple like he was very focused on sung on his own failing capabilities. And I liked how he kind of like just appears in various different places. And it's, it's funny where he's walking around thinking that he's King shit and then people are recognizing him. So he's not being as clever as he thinks he is. Like Picard picks him out as the therapist that's messing with the, the young Picard woman that's supposed to go up in the spaceship. Mm. Um, Renee. Yeah. Renee, Renee Picard. And, and, uh, then he walks into the interrogation room and um, Guinan recognizes him <laughs> right away. Mm. Was it Guinan? It was Guinan. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I was so happy for that as well because ever since Q Who in Next Generation, there was an, which was the episode where Q introduces Starfleet to the Borg, there's this whole thing between him and Guinan and he calls her like a meddlesome imp. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, and, and there's this definite conflict between them, 
and it's not really explained why. Right. And we finally get some payoff for that, which I was I was happy with how they they wrote that in. And I mean, you wouldn't have a season of Picard without a couple of callbacks to other TNG um, cast members. So um, mm. while uh, Whoopi Goldberg was only in it for a little bit, uh, reprising her role as as Guinan, uh, they had someone else playing Guinan for the rest of the uh, the series or the season rather. Yeah. Um, who did a bang up job and she's not on the front page of imdb i'm uh, her name is escaping me right now um but the um other one was wesley crusher <laughs> which i was not expecting yeah that blew all of us away because they'd already announced season three that pretty much every single cast member was coming back apart from will wheaton right and and initially you're thinking well he's off with the traveler and maybe that's difficult to to wrangle in for whatever adventure that they're planning on doing next season. And they kept that under wraps really well. And so when he appeared, that was, yeah, that was pretty impressive. And especially a lot of weight with the stuff that he said as well. Yeah, because he's part of a group of travelers or he is, they are travelers. I can't remember exactly what he said. Um, yeah, so there's the traveler who is a being that uh, that saw his potential uh, he's also the one that got Picard to make uh, Wesley an acting ensign. And when Wesley then left the Enterprise to travel with the Traveler, he then helped create the Watchers. And so the the whole idea Watchers. of the Watchers, which is, yeah, which is effectively what Talon is and what he's recruiting Corey to be. And it's the fact that he calls them supervisors because there's an episode in the original series. It's the season finale of season two called Assignment Earth. It was an episode that Gene Roddenberry made as a backdoor pilot to do another show about a character called Gary Seven. And he was Supervisor 194. And he was trying to keep an eye on the timeline and make sure that events unfolded that Earth would be safe. And so they've managed to do a throwback all the way to the original series that Wesley is going through time and space like the Doctor from Doctor Who, traveling around, and he's now responsible for hiring Gary Seven, who helps uh, prevent nuclear disaster you know, back in the 20th century. It's, uh, it's a pretty deep cut that they've done with that there. And he's not coming back for season three. We know that Isa Brion is, isn't coming back for season three. So it really hangs it up in the air as to, could this be a door into a new spin-off show or could they end up in discovery or could they end up in strange new worlds? We have no idea. Uh, yeah. I, I will have to say that the, the Corey and Sung and, uh, Wesley stuff was at the bottom of my list in terms of Picard season two. None of it I found mm. very interesting other than like, oh, okay, we're just getting an insight into how Sung got into like cloning before he got into androids. And I mean, not the same person. It's not like a descendant or something. Um, yeah. But but stuff like that I find was very second story and and really didn't didn't resonate with me in the same way that I wanted to know more about uh, about um about Picard's past. Uh, I wanted to know more about, um, specifically, I was interested in how uh, Seven was was coping with like not having Borg implants and being disconnected in that way. I found yeah. that character kind of stuff interesting. And um, I, I wasn't really sure I followed the reason why that Talon looked like the Romulan that picard that was in love with picard in his normal timeline like i don't know why they did that or how that would even be possible so it's more than likely and it's kind of assumed that uh that they are related oh okay that, that talon is going to be a uh an ancestor okay of laris because it's revealed that she is romulan she's got a, a device that will make her ears appear human right and her forehead and stuff but if she disables it then it takes eight hours to recharge uh, but she's romulan she looks the same 
she's likely an ancestor, maybe not directly in terms of like great great grandmother or something. It could even just be, you know, as a great great aunt or something, but related somehow. Right. Okay. So there, there are a number of things that they kind of glaze over and a number of things get really muddy because of the time travel stuff, which again was my least favorite thing about the whole thing. Like all the inter-character stories I thought were great um, for the most yeah. part, but I, the time travel stuff, like I don't think we needed it. It, it really felt kind of forced. Um, it's at, also kind of very cute at the same time. Well, there's that too. Okay. So that's fair. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I, and I say the, the other thing that I, I did not like uh, wasn't a big fan of Gerardi becoming the Borg queen. I, that, oh, really? Okay. No, that seemed, it seemed to remove the threat of the Borg and it seemed to remove, for me, their uniqueness, I guess. Because it's like, how do we solve the Borg? We just made them more human. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's definitely going to change how the Borg are from now on. They, the Borg have already been pretty much decimated after Voyager because the very final episode has... Uh, yeah, spoilers for anybody who's not seen something that's a couple of decades old, but uh, Janeway pretty much devastates the Borg. So they're in a complete mess. And so just quickly, where's the timeline for Janeway and Picard? Like, are they existing at the same time? Uh, Janeway is an admiral. She is, uh, in fact, the Star Trek Prodigy is the show that she's currently in, and that's roughly around the same time. Okay, so... So yeah, the Borg... she's, she's been back on Earth. She's an admiral and has been for a while but, at this point. But the Borg stuff that she did, that happened during Picard's lifetime? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you had... Um, uh, whilst the movies were happening, Voyager was lost in the Delta Quadrant. Okay. So... Okay. This is the stuff that I never keep straight. Like, that's the yeah. stuff that just is beyond <laughs> me. Um, but, anyway, I really like uh, Alison Pill uh, in, in the show. Yeah. I think she's a she's a good actor, and, and I think she plays the subtleties of Gerardi very well and did really well with, like, all the, like, the Borg Queen is inside my head sort of stuff. Um, mm, yeah, that's the stuff I really enjoyed about her performance. Yeah, I mean, that was yeah. cool. I kind of saw it coming a mile away. Like, the moment that she starts, like, you're you're alone on the spaceship with the Borg Queen. What could go wrong? Like, oh, God, here yeah. we go. And so that that kind of stuff, I thought, was um, a little bit... It felt like 90s TV at that point. Like, it felt like I was watching Lois and Clark and the bad guy has shown up, you know? Um, <laughs> but other than that, like, I enjoyed the rest of it. Um, what I really thought was interesting, and they did it um, a lot faster than I thought. There was a moment between, I think it was Rafi and Seven were talking. And there was something about the chair or there was a joke about captaining a ship or something. Mm. And then yeah. in the final episode, Picard, because he's got so much going on, he gives like he as the Admiral on the ship back in their own timeline, he, he gives seven her first commission as captain Yeah. on, is it the yep. stargazer? Is that what they're on? Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Um, and that made me think because earlier before they did that in this show, when they made the side comment about like seven in the chair, I thought, oh, are they trying to make another spinoff? Like, are they trying to give Jerry Ryan her own show? I would watch it because uh, I really <laughs> like I really like seven of nine. Like I find the character very interesting. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. But but I was like, oh, I really are they really going to force feed us that? But then, of course, they put her in the chair like briefly in this in this initial episode or this final episode rather. And I was like, okay, well, they're not just going to like tease that and let that hang out there. They're going to do it in this. Sh that was foreshadowing for this moment, not for like some other moment that, you know, the, that yeah. the, the greater Star Trek fandom is going to run with. And she is coming back for season three. So cool. again, that could have, yeah, you know, could be part of the setup for what happens in that final season. Yeah. I mean, she's, I also really enjoy her. She's a good actor and she's, she's good as, as, seven and really had some interesting we'll say development in this ser in this season because of course yeah. when the timeline alters she doesn't have her borg implants and so she even i think at that point remembers that she's veronica was her name i think is what they said um, annika annika, annika Hansen. And, sorry yeah. again uh, again with the compression on crave it's hard to hear sometimes so <laughs> um, but really like really cool. Like I didn't know that. I didn't know. Like, of mm. course you just, you don't think about that when you're watching Voyager, when you're 20, you know, you're just kind of like watching on TV, like, all right, this is seven of nine. She's a Borg. Of course her name is a number that makes sense. Um, and you don't think about what, who she was before that. Right. 
Uh, and I thought that was thought that was really cool. And especially as she was assimilated as a young child, she spent right. most of her life as a Bojone. Whereas a lot of Bojones that you tend to see have been assimilated in their adult life. So that was always an interesting part of her character. Anyway, I enjoyed the the full season. Uh, it got it got a little convoluted. I want to say around episode eight, they just had to do a lot. You know, like yeah, Gerardi had to do the thing with the Borg Queen, and then Sung attacked with apparently he's got a private military, and then the private military became Borg drones. Like just it really got convoluted fast. Yeah, the the pacing was a bit odd. And some of the stuff towards the end feels like it should have been happening a little bit sooner in the mm-hmm. season. Yeah. Uh, before it kind of got to that. Because you, you're kind of running to like, we've only got an episode left. And we're, we're only just starting to get into the stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and things like you knew that Rios was going to stay behind. Like you just yeah. you, you saw that coming a mile away. I'm not saying it was bad. I'm just saying that it wasn't a giant shock. Um, you can have proper cigars now. Yeah. Which is great. I don't so. understand why Elnor <laughs> came back as the hologram. Like it, it, it just felt like uh, we need to get um, the actor in another episode, <laughs> sort of deal. Yeah. Um. And it was, but it was good for Raffi's character to kind of go through understanding the kind of harm that she has and give her the opportunity to have a make an apology that she never would be able to do. But she's in, in smart a very Star Trek way. Yeah, but she's smart enough to know that's not him. You know, like I, I know that, uh, yeah. that's what I was just like, well, fine. Apologize to the real one when you get back, like have that moment as like a wind down moment and, and a conclusion for her. Well, there's no going back because he's, he's dead. It's only the only reason he's back at the end is because Q brought him back to life. That's what he I wasn't mean. going to have that opportunity. So have that otherwise. gift because he calls it a gift. Have that gift when you get back. Like, I know she's not going to have that opportunity, but she wouldn't have needed to take the opportunity then if the hologram had been rios you know as yeah. it was before like I, I i found it forced that they like that to me did mm. not make sense even in star trek land i was just like no no like this does this is all just too um convenient i guess for storytelling and i was yeah. just like nah it's fine but like i said small grievances overall i thought it was i thought it was a good season i really enjoy watching patrick stewart um doing yeah. doing and, his thing and um, and and especially bouncing off of john delancey as well i i I don't tear up at a lot of things. I definitely teared up right at the very end when they were having their goodbyes and, mm. you know, and talking about, uh, you know, not dying alone and things. It's, that was a very emotional moment that they both played very, very well. Yeah. And some interesting reveals too for Picard in terms of his past and some emotional stuff that he yeah. was, he was um, dealing with, with his mother's yeah. suicide. And, and I thought that bringing that to light was interesting because you don't, you never got that personal with a lot of the characters in TNG. Like you just, it, it didn't oh. get there. Um, and you certainly don't have time to get there in a blockbuster film, right? It's, you've got a plot to deal with in two hours. You, you know, some la- layers of story got, got, you know, written into the, the yeah. later seasons of TNG, but they never really got into Picard too much. Like they always kind of, was- left that that open which i thought was um i mean good and bad like he yeah. kind of that kind of authority yeah. you don't want to know everything about him and because you the viewer don't know everything about him he remains that authority right like he remains the captain there's there's an episode as well in one of the uh, the first two seasons i can't recall which one but there's one where he's basically having um you know he, he's seeing this image of his mother at a table in the middle of the corridor offering him tea and he says how he he often imagines her as an old lady offering him some tea and that just is so much more powerful when you realize like the reason he's imagining her growing old is because she didn't get the opportunity to yeah and so even just like the very early seasons of tng you can now look in a very different light in some regards with some of the stuff they've done into the which is just really well done and they handled the the final kind of like it wasn't even an embrace. It was they hold hands uh, with Laris and um, and Picard there. Um, yeah. When he gets back yeah. and he realizes, like, now that he's gone through this therapy, which was season two was therapy for Picard, uh, and, <laughs> and and he's able to express himself with with Laris. Uh, the yeah. only thing that really threw me was they were standing in the the atrium, like the the sunroom 
uh, where he had thrown a rock and smashed the glass as a kid and it had been restored. So they're standing very poignantly, you know, where his mother had hung herself, where he had smashed the glass. Now it's back. He's mm-hmm. in the his current future and and everything is back and, and, you know, it's his home. They have them like holding hands in this in this thing. And then not only do, do they do 180 and move the camera to the complete other side of them. So Picard and Lars are now flipped and facing the other direction. But when they pull back out, they've got them so far deep into the house that they're not under the glass anymore. Oh, on the shot where they kind of pull out. Yeah, they do this kind of wide like shot. A, they, like a drone camera that just yeah. goes up to the sky and stuff. Yeah, well, it's all CG. Yeah. Like they're standing on some yes. green screen stage somewhere. And they didn't yeah, even bother yeah. to put them in the right spot. <laughs> you know, like, and it was like glaringly wrong. It's like, no, they were underneath the skylight two seconds ago. And now, because I'm just like, oh, they're in a different position. Did time pass? Am I supposed to be watching them closely to see what has, has transpired? Nope, they're in the exact same pose. They've just put them in the wrong spot in the house. It's just the kind of stuff that I noticed. But I was just like, mm. that kind of stuff. Like, oh, wow, that's that's a mistake do better next time um <laughs> everything else about the show was 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 pretty good uh again rocky start um the whole totalitarian feature whatever i think by around whenever rios got sick and had to be sick or shot i don't remember whether he got sick or beat up but he had to be attended to he hit his head that's what it was he hit his head and he had to be attended to by um rodriguez ramirez what was his name ramirez uh, um, yeah. Yeah. So he had to be at once that happened, once he ended up in in Ramirez's clinic, then I was like, OK, th- this is where things are getting interesting. You know, people are losing communicators. They're in 2024 and they don't even have cell phones, <laughs> so they can't talk to one another. So uh, it, it became a little bit more of an adventure at that point. Um, but yeah, leading up to that, it was a bit of a bit of a slog in terms of convoluted and all that kind of stuff. But anyway. We should move on t- uh, to the the other show, uh, which thankfully we don't have a whole season to summarize. We can just talk about <laughs> Strange New Worlds episode one and two. Uh, so spoilers again, yeah. if you haven't seen it, um, there's not really much to spoil. I mean, like there's no big reveals. They just kind of go through a Star Trek episode twice. Um, but there are some really cool moments and really, some really cool lines and reveals, things that I didn't know because I only saw like one trailer for Strange mm-hmm. New Worlds. So again, spoilers. I didn't know Ohura was in it, which is oh, awesome. Really? Okay. Yeah. No, I had yeah. no idea. Uh, didn't know she was in it. Uh, as and, a cadet, no yes. less as well. And I was confused. I had to text you because I didn't realize that Kirk. So it's not it's not James Kirk. It's Samuel Kirk. Yes. Which yeah. is his brother. Yes, who was in the season one series finale, uh, which was Operation Annihilate. I get confused with the timelines because I thought Kirk was an only child. No, no, he's uh, he's had a brother there. His there was a character as well that was supposed to be his brother, but the scene was uh, deleted in the J.J. Abrams movie, oh, okay. and so it just became his his friend uh, as opposed to his brother. Uh, but yeah, ever since then. But the reason why it doesn't stick in people's minds is because when we see his brother, it's just William Shatner playing dead with a, m- a mustache stuck onto his face. We never actually see his brother alive. Oh, okay. He's just dead on the floor uh, when we see him. So that's why it's it doesn't stand out as much. And he doesn't really, like, he doesn't mention his brother again after that. It's like the only time that it's really mentioned. So, and, and that's why it's kind of interesting to have here because we know that uh, that Kirk is supposed to appear in season two at some point in some capacity. And so to have some uh, you know, dialogue between the two of them could be quite interesting, actually. Very cool. I mean, I, I'm i on board with it because, of course, we, we've seen Christopher Pike in a couple of different places, including uh, Anson Mount playing Christopher Pike in Discovery, who I really enjoyed. Um, I've yeah. been a fan of Anson Mount for a while. He was on Hell on Wheels, which is one of my favorite Western TV shows I've ever seen and Mm -hmm. he's phenomenal in that and he's he's good in this it's different like it's it's very different than the roles i've normally seen him in uh he plays pretty like sullen like tight-lipped kind of like grumbly cowboy in hell on wheels and and then this he's much more bravado and very intelligent soft-spoken but outspoken like i i really like uh christopher pike i find what i'm what is so unique about 
in Strange New World so far is how casual all the language is. Yep. But it's been ages since I've seen the original series. So, like, is the original series that casual too? No, I, I think that he just has a far more relaxed atmosphere on the bridge than we typically see mm. in in a lot of these shows. Uh, I would say that probably the closest to it would be, if not Voyager, then Enterprise. Because, you know, especially like Scott Bakula and just the, the kind of relaxed nature that he had, it, it feels a little bit like that as well. And, I mean, you've got things like when he beams down and he's between the two warring factions and he just he beams in and appears and he's just like, hi. Yeah. You know, it's that really calm thing. Or when you've had Ortega hazing a her, you know, about wearing a dress uniform and they show up at the door and Pike greets, he's like, Ortega, Cadet Uhura, welcome. <laughs> dress uniform, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and he's just, he just picks up on it. He's just, he's just so casual with, with everything. Yeah, well, because to, to take it stride, and it's smart. Like, I mean, I, I it it really yeah. has, you know, it, it's what ties the crew together is like his personal ability, I guess, without a better way to express that. Um, mm. And and I think it's, I mean, it makes the crew respect him even more. And I like, I like, I like his his one liners are the best. In this last episode, he leans over to number one. After they decided like, ah, we just hatched a plan in, you know, a minute and a half to save this planet of a billion people from this comet. <laughs> I love this job. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, and I'm just like, that's pretty, I mean, immediately thereafter, the plan does not work and leads to the entire episode going sideways. But just that moment of like cockiness, but also like um, sincerity is also really good. Uh, yeah. And and I like half the time when he's on the bridge and people are like, you know, what are your orders, Captain? I kind of half expect him to kind of point at the view screen and go mm, that way. <laughs> you know, like mm. just, I don't know, head that way for two, however long we want to go. Like he doesn't on an, on the surface, he doesn't seem to have a plan. But then you get into an altercation like in the episode two that I watched tonight where they have to evade this alien ship and he's got a plan like he's got uh, mm. uh, evasion maneuvers. He's got tactics like he he knows what he's doing but on the surface you don't think he does he's also very open to suggestions from the crew like the moment that he's told like you we need to go to red alert he, he just wants a very quick explanation and when he's got that he's like yep okay let's do it shields up you know yeah. and uh you know whatever whenever there is something he's just kind of like you know has anybody got ideas he's very open with that and, and going on board and, and making those decisions, which is really what you want in a, in a captain really. And I liked episode two a lot better than I liked episode one. How about you? Yeah. The, I, especially when I was just watching, um, Ortega and Ohura right at the beginning and just the way that they were bantering off each other. I just thought, you know what? I already love these characters with discovery. There was a lot of, you know, there's some characters there. They stand around. They see lines. I'd like to know more about them just because I know nothing about them. Whereas these people, I want to know more about them because they are fun. Yeah. And, I, you know, and they're interesting. And they, you know, they, they, they just, you know, I'm just drawn to, to, the, to them all. Like, like Hammer as well. Having an, an R on the ship as well is, is fantastic. He's the, the, the chief engineer who's not impaired because his senses are superior and yes yeah yeah because he's he's blind most of their species are blind and right. they're, they're an offshoot of the andorians but they have telepathic ability so their telepathy is what allows them to see uh you know rather than using actual eyesight and he is really really fun and i cannot wait to see a lot more of him like when he fixes stuff like he you know they try and get the ship going. He manages to, and they're like, how do you do it? And it's like, because I'm good at my job. I can't yeah. remember the exact line, but it was, yeah. <laughs> it was effectively that. There was, a, there was another one, too, where um, uh, uh, La'an, I think that's how you pronounce her name, Nunyan Singh. Uh, yes. She's the chief um, security officer. She was saying, like, you know, torpedoes could do it. It would take about an hour to retrofit. And then he has something snarky to say, which, again, I couldn't make out because of Crave. But it was essentially like, you know, you say that and I'm the one that has to do the 
the configuration. You know, like she's saying yeah. this is how long it's going to take. And he's like, let me tell them how long it's going to take because I'm the one that has to do it. <laughs> smarty pants you know like yeah. it's but it's very yeah. matter of fact you know like he's not what and this leads me to the one thing that i i do find very odd about the show is that i don't remember spock being so robotic in discovery when they were showing him with um i'm just blanking on her name who's the main character in S- S- discovery um oh burnham burnham um because they're brother or sister and yeah and but spock like in this it's not just his delivery i i expect his delivery to be pretty spock like you know as would one would do because i'm used to and grew up with watching leonard Leonard nimoy do it uh but even leonard nimoy had a matter of fact way of speaking uh ethan peck is doing a bit more robotic but what gets me is the robotic body movements that he does afterwards. Like he kind of moves from the waist. It's not like he turns his head at all. It's very, he looks like a Muppet sometimes. I'm just like, there's, I get that you're Spock, but you're not a robot. There's, there's a bit of a transition happening uh, with this because in the short tracks, in the, the season two short tracks they did, there's an episode Q&A and it's Una and Spock trapped in a turbo lift and we've always seen from the original pilot the cage that spock had a lot more emotion and that's just because by the time it actually got picked up for a series the characters of spock and una essentially got merged and he became the very logical unemotional apart from just some rare instances where he will burst out with emotion but again they're very few and far between in the original series but she starts to talk to him about how he, you know, he could, if he holds back some of those emotions and, and chooses that more logical side, that may actually help him more when it comes to functioning on the ship. And it's a, it's a very interesting short for it, but it really kind of highlights his change from the Spock that we know in the cage to what we know from the original series. And there's moments where he's back to a little bit of the emotional side, and then there's the really robotic side, and it feels like he's just trying to get that balance between the two. So wait a minute, what's the cage? Is that a Discovery episode? No, the cage was the original pilot that was made in the 60s with oh. uh, Jeffrey Hunter as Captain Pike. Right. So my, my main re- comparison is, is, is Ethan Peck, the exact same actor, being very wooden and robotic in Strange New Worlds and not in Discovery. Yes, because Discovery happens just after the cage and effectively the network didn't like the cage they then told him shoot another pilot and then that's when jeffrey hunter decided he didn't want to do the role and then william shatner was picked up but we have the cage happens uh leonard nimoy was the only actor that was in both pilots so wait and a his spock was very different they're basing stuff in this in this series off of a pilot that didn't air Yes, from over 50 years ago. Okay, so that's some hot bullshit. Like, I'm just like the, the fact that I'm confused by the characters acting and, and mannerisms in Strange New Worlds because I didn't watch an unaired pilot from 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Well, like, it, it that, did get released and it is, it is but there, but uh, that, no, that's and but you're asking, and then they've like that's a lot, that's a reach. <laughs> yeah, because well, well, everybody p- p- part of the problem. That, that people have had for for several decades now is trying to justify how is it that we've got the Spock that we know, but in this one episode that that did that eventually was released and shown, Spock was completely different. And a lot of people try to come up with ways of explaining it. And so they've tried to do that in the bridge between Discovery and, and Strange New Worlds. And, and part of that was with Short Tracks. Right. And it's a shame that they didn't have that scene from Short Tracks as part of Discovery. I think had it been in that, it would have been a bit misplaced in a way. Um, it's nice that they cut the time to dedicate to it, but it is also kind of like, if you haven't seen that short tracks, you do miss out a little bit on it in a some way. A little bit. I'm missing the whole yeah. ball game. <laughs> like, I'm t- if that's what they're trying to do, they're failing. Because I liked Spock. I liked the range that they gave Spock. Even the banter between Spock and Pike in discovery was great and it is okay ish here but most of the time he's just 
terribly wooden. And yes, there is some lines, especially there is some conversation between him and Ohura in episode two. And again, everything is better in episode two, including Spock. Uh, still mm. the worst thing about the series right now, which is unfortunate, but but better in episode two. Um, but if you muscle through these terrible wooden kind of like deliveries, then there is some quality content there. It's just that it's you're relying on the other characters to give it the weight that it deserves. Really good example, mm. which was funny, was um, Spock giving Ohura a pep, pep talk during their... Um, <laughs> Tra- yes. when they were trapped on the asteroid yeah and he just kind of gives her like matter of fact you know we are still alive so therefore you know because this guy got shocked and had a his heart stopped we now know one thing we shouldn't do so we are farther ahead than we were before <laughs> and and Ohura was just like is that your version of a pep talk and he's like yes i am working on them <laughs> and she's like yeah keep <laughs> keep keep the pedal to the floor on that and it's because of her that it's funny, not necessarily because of him. Like I had flashbacks mm. of like Big Bang Theory watching that scene. Um, but then the next one that he gives her, he's it, it's a little bit more like you, what you want from Spock, where it's matter of fact, but it's delivered in a soft way that really hits home. And she then says, like, that was a good one. Like, I like that was that hit the, the nail on the head, you know, um, and I like their dynamic so far. Uh, I really yeah. I like what's going on there. Um, and then the other character that I thought was, we got more from her in episode one and I don't remember the name of the aliens, but, um, Nun- Nunyan Singh, uh, the chief security officer. Uh, yeah. I like her. She's, I like that. She's kind of very matter of fact. Like, I mean, she's kind of the typical security, like she shoots the guns, you know, like she's kind of gruff around the edges. Yeah. Uh, but she reveals, is it, is it the Gorn? Is that the name? It is the goal. Yes. The Gorn. So remind yeah. me who they are. So there's an episode from the original series, The Arena, and it's the episode where Kirk is fighting a guy in a giant lizard suit. Right. In okay. the desert. I knew that we're, so very I knew iconic would episode. be like a monster type thing. Like I was thinking yeah. like, you know, I probably had an image from TNG in my head, but yeah. But but yeah okay I'm I'm with you there okay so yeah the, she, the only other time the Gorn have appeared is in Enterprise as a CGI model but they 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 never did it in any other shows past the original series right no I'm just remembering a different alien like I'm th- I'm thinking about right, something yeah. else from TNG um but but this she talks about being like the sole survivor of like some sort of like terrible murder fest that happened that the Gorn basically just yeah. come in and killed everybody on either her planet or her settlement or something. It was she, a colony ship she was on. Yeah. Right. And so she's kind of like throwing a fish back. She was the one that got shot into space. And then number mm. one found her when she was on another starship. Um, yeah, and the I USS Martin Luther King Jr. is the one that they were serving together. on. Oh, I didn't catch that. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a really, really nice name for the ship. Uh, but I like that. Like I, it's not a lot and they mm. don't over explain it and they don't put the whole brakes on. Like they, there's a reason she brings it up. I don't remember what that reason was, but it wasn't terribly out of context. She's talking to Pike about it. They're, they're talking about something at a table and, yeah. um, and, and it's just, it's just enough of a backstory. If you go like, okay, you are now no longer just a bridge member to me, right? Like you are, yeah. I'm going to be paying attention to the things that you say and the things that you do because I'm curious about your backstory and I'm curious about how that affects you emotionally now. Yeah, especially with the stuff that she's seen. Like, it was pretty gruesome, this yes. kind of stuff. Yeah. And then saying that... And a lot of the conversation with Pike was talking about how knowing that she could die is what kept her alive as Pike's trying to figure out you know, and have a bit of a revelation, really, that him knowing his fate and that he's going to be mortally injured is probably the thing that's actually going to keep him going. And he's seeing that in himself based on the fact that she was able to survive because that was the one thing that was different with her compared to anybody else that was on that colony ship. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, they do a really good and, job with with her. Yeah. And um, the other character that's very matter of fact, but in a sarcastic way uh, that I adore is uh, Nurse Chapel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> she's yeah. awesome. The, the, she's very different to the Nurse Chapel that 
we'll get in the next 10 years. But the way that she plays off of Dr. Mbenga is brilliant. I think they are fantastic together as a, as a duo in sick bay. And I cannot wait to see more scenes with them there. Yeah. Cause my first introduction, well, everybody's first introduction to her was in the first episode where she's giving the crew basically like she's resplicing their genome or something. She's doing something very yeah. drastic to make them look like aliens so that they can go down to this um, planet and be, uh, and blend in as, as locals. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Um, the, the way that she's just kind of like going around and just getting ready to stick people with this thing, by the way, this is going to, this is the first one's a sedative. The next one is going to be the thing. And the first one is so that you don't feel the pain of the second one. And she's yeah. saying it as she's like approaching them with the needle. Like you have 10 seconds to agree to what I'm going to stick in your neck. You know, like it's just, <laughs> it's, and, and what's really funny about it is that she's saying it all with a smile because she's just nerding out on the science of it all. Right. Like she's just yeah. so impressed that she's been able to do it. The fact that it causes pain is just, it's fine. I've got a sedative for that. You know, like problem <laughs> solved, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute. And I just, I really enjoyed that. And she did the same thing with uh, episode two where she was giving them a shot for like the high levels of radiation or something on the asteroid. Um, yeah. And, and she was going around and, and giving it to each one of them. And this time she didn't say that it was going to hurt. It was Ohura that mentioned it hurts. And there was some callback to like, the last time I mentioned this, people get all out of sorts. Now you all want to know. Like it, it was just... It was really, really cool. And then she flirts with Spock, which was hilarious. Uh, and yeah. and um, and to, to, to true, true to form, which I thought was really interesting, when when Noonien Singh gets her shot, she barely even winces. Like she kind of just yeah. acknowledges it. Yeah. Well, she was wanting to feel pain as well. Like that's been a big thing is mm -hmm. wanting to, to experience the pain and not have that all numbed down for her, which again is probably going to come into a lot of her backstory Mm -hmm. uh, especially given the the weight of her last name as well. Yes, as, right. Uh, leaves a, a lot open to exactly how she ties into the fact that she is related to the Khan, Union Singh. Right. Okay. Here's the thing: I get Sung and Singh mixed up real quick. <laughs> right. Yes. There's there's in universe and out of universe reasons for that as well. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. So. The the out of universe thing is just that Gene Roddenberry had a friend join the war that had I can't remember the first name but the last name was Noonien Singh and he used that name for Khan. I think it was Kim Noonien Singh. I think may have been the guy. Anyway, so he, he used it as Khan Noonien Singh, and then when he created the Next Generation, he had Noonien Sung as the creator of Data, which again was supposed to be an homage to the same guy. And what they've cleverly done is that in Enterprise, they had Arik Soong, who is an ancestor of Noonien, that's dealing with all the genetic stuff that's based on the work with Khan. And we just saw, as we mentioned kind of in Picard, uh, with Adam Soong, he's got the, the plans for the project that made Khan. So yeah. it all kind of ties in. So it's the fact that you've got that going on uh, and over multiple generations uh, to the point that one member of the family then goes i'm even going to name my kid after this guy right which is kind of messed up but there we go that's both in and our universe kind of things and why they're kind of similar as far as like the rest of the cast and um where the series is going like the the feel of strange new worlds for me is just spot on like it is yeah it's got some deep characters not everybody is comfortable you know, and um, Captain Christopher Pike has, has um, seen his own death in the future. And that's kind of haunting him almost like um, almost like a premonition of PTSD. Like it's he's got some mm. some things that that he's working through. The characters all have layers, which I think is great. Yeah, it's a very different take as well. Like it's not really a direction that we've ever seen before. Just having a captain that knows their own fate it adds a whole different ball game yeah i hope they don't dwell on it for the whole season i don't think they will i think it's more just going to be there for motivation yeah i mean he's been pretty i mean given all of that obviously behind closed quarters where he's been talking with uno about it but generally on the bridge like he's still having fun he's, he's still being jovial and stuff it's not dragging him down he's still able to uh to be that guy which is good 
Yeah. No, the conversations with the, I don't know, remember what they called themselves, but the, the aliens that were watching over the shepherds oh, the, of the, the shepherds. Uh, yeah. Of the asteroid. Um, really interesting concept by the way. Um, yeah. and that was really cool and probably gave itself a, a bit of a favor by being on like a view screen, but the aliens looked really good. Mm. You know, like yeah. it, it had, it looked like it was a real person's mouth, but then they had like CG eyes that were larger and wider apart. And it had like yeah. parts of its head were kind of moving in and out, which was really cool. Um, the universal translator, I thought they gave a good nod to it. Like in terms of like a, by the way, this is why we can all understand English on the show, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. and they, and they even gave kind of like a nod is like, it's not perfect, but like, Hey, they're called shepherds, I guess. And even Pike is like shepherds. And the person at the, at the con for the, the translators like, I don't know. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> uh, which I thought was good. Um, yeah, but yeah, he has some fun with that. Like whenever he like cut oh, the yeah. audio and turned around to say something, he's like, wow, we are up our, you know, up to our ankles in this one. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's some, <laughs> there's some good, some good moments there. Um, there, he had some good spots in, in the first episode too, which, which I really like. I just, I like he's cavalier. I kind of wonder whether, um, his future knowing his future will help him be a little bit more cavalier because if he's if he's if if he's in a really dire situation he's just like well i know i don't die here <laughs> so <laughs> might as well throw caution yeah. to the wind and like go in guns a blazing um that yeah. was the, that was the other thing someone said basically how do we get the shields to go down if we use phasers at the right harmonics they might it might work and it translates to to pike being like really we get to shoot it i like this plan shoot it <laughs> like just yeah. like that. i like this plan this is a good plan <laughs> yeah like so your plan is pew 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 i'm on board let's do this yeah i, I yeah. just I, again <laughs> like you get the idea that despite his troubles he really enjoys his job um so yeah. so and i and i think I, I didn't even get into this yet and we can't spend too much time on it but it is a beautiful show the set is fantastic so much yeah. color it looks like my living room when it goes to red alert. Like it's so cool <laughs> the way that all the lights change, which by the way, this show with my Govi TV immersion kit is phenomenal. Like, Oh, I can imagine between yeah, the bridge there's... lights, the lights changing, the switching from inside to outer space. And when they're on in episode two, when they're on the asteroid inside the structure, and uh uhura is singing to the cave and the cave is lighting up and singing back my whole living room was changing colors like it was really cool that's what i was thinking when the moment you were saying like that's that's got to have been a, a pretty impressive moment yeah and and you've even got the fact that one of the biggest things and this is something that was always talked about right back in the 60s was that uh and even with next generation the ship is one of the biggest stars of the show. Like the ship is a character unto itself. And when you're in that second episode and the ship is just swaying, just flying through all the asteroids, just the motion of it, it's just kind of like, there is character to this thing. They have animated just the motion of it so well that it is very much you know, a character in there and the, it was it was so fun watching that yeah i i liked it too I, there was a couple of moments where i felt like for whatever reason i felt like we were losing the scale of it like it started to move a little bit too much like mm. a fighter plane and i was just like ah, yeah that's, yeah which is cool but then it starts to feel small and that's just like our own brains superimposing vehicles that we know that move <laughs> like that you know what i mean um so yeah. it's it's not i'm not saying it's any it's not wasn't a big deal but it really kind of like pulled me out for a second. I was like, wait a minute, what am I watching? How is this doing its thing? I, I suppose the other thing is how much gravity is being exerted by that asteroid. Is that having an effect that you wouldn't normally have when it's just yeah. through space? That yeah. could have been adding to the motion, possibly. So, I mean, like, it's it's still good. Like, I mean, I thought it was great. And, and yeah. it, it's definitely more action-packed than a lot of Star Trek that I've seen before uh, in terms yeah. of space battles and flying around and, and stuff like that, which I think was great. Yeah. And, and a couple of other you know, sort of additional characters that they brought in, like Robert April and Mr. Kyle, just having those little nods as well, uh, again, is, is just a nice icing on the cake too. I don't know who they, who they are. Mr. Kyle's the transporter chief. He's been throughout the original series and animated series, and he was even in The Wrath of Khan. 
on the Reliant, and then Robert April was the first captain of the Enterprise, and he's the admiral. He, he's admiral at this point, and he's the the one who brings Pike back into Starfleet. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So th- those are some subtle things that I wouldn't wouldn't yeah. have, have picked up on. Yeah, yeah. For, for for people like myself who've who've uh, been invested quite heavily, it's yeah. it's just nice seeing that. Again, we're just getting all these little details coming in. Which is yeah, great. there's another little detail actually. Speaking of this, of the Enterprise zipping around, where Pike walks up to uh, Ortega and says, "Like, all yeah. right, you know, best pilot in the in your class, Ortega," and she's looking at him like, "How did you know that?" <laughs> you know, because she was basically <laughs> like bragging. And he's just kind of like, look, I know a lot of stuff. <laughs> Now's the time to prove it, hot shot. Like, I just, I love that yeah. he's asking her to do a very serious thing that is extremely difficult. And he's joking with her about it. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, it's, I really yeah. enjoy, I really enjoy that aspect. Like, he even leans on her console. You know, <laughs> like, it just, yeah. That kind of stuff, I think, is spot on. She's fun as well. I think that, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I mean, I feel like I'm a stuck record because I think that they're all fun. There's just so many good aspects of that. I think they're just going to bounce off each other so well. They they just seem to gel straight away, which, you know, as a career, it must be fun on set. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I, well, yeah. And I think you and I, have, you've, I think you brought it to my attention. I'm pretty sure that you sent me a tweet from Anson Mount where he's just like, I am just giddy <laughs> that I am part yeah. of this. Like he's probably just pinch myself. Like I'm, I'm on Star Trek. Holy crap. Uh, yeah, and, it, it, like you feel that yeah. coming, like just radiating off him, and, yeah. and and that's one thing that that I was surprised by because they get him reading, you know, like you know our ongoing mission to explore strange new worlds and like all that kind of stuff. <laughs> that that thing is read at the beginning yeah. of every episode. The one yeah. thing that they didn't do, which they wish they had done, is uh, while I do like the music for the show. I feel like there needed to be just a little bit more of a nod. And this is just me watching like a decade of TNG. Like after they mm. finished their talk and the zip, the, sh- the ship zips off into space, like you have to have the music start to play. And it's not the fanfare that you expect. It starts a lot softer. And mm. I feel like they don't, they didn't have to, I, I, I don't want them to use the original music. Like I'm glad that they made something new for the show. Every show should have its own theme. But I kind of wish they had started at least with the same note, because <laughs> my head goes da 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 da, and nothing happens. Yeah. I'm just like that's not that's nowhere near what happens, and 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 always they, disappoints me. They do me. have a little subtle bit of the original series theme. Yes, it is kind of embedded in there a little bit, but they just they yeah. don't quite get or even the original series. Like they, it still needs to start off with a little bit more of an oomph from the get go, because mm. it builds up to this crescendo of the ship, and then it just kind of like slowly builds the music and you're like nah i wanted more of a punch than that to 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 quote christopher pike they need to hit it (laughs) yeah moving on into the internet minute actually i'm gonna i'm gonna cut myself off there um hold on one minute and 14 all kinds of fuck ups tonight I have a couple that I've noted just so that you've actually got timestamps for yeah, I've got, I've got knocks time that I know that I did. Yeah. Um, so bottom line, uh, I am thoroughly enjoying Strange New Worlds, which is a relief because I have a struggle with uh, Discovery and Picard I'm watching, but uh, I can't say I'm liking all of it all the time. Whereas so far, like Spock aside, Strange New World is like knocking it out of the park for me. That's really good. And and again, with just how much variety there is, I think it's one of those things where there's a Star Trek show for for everybody. True. Right now, there's so much variety there. And, uh, but of all of them, this is probably the most fun, the one that feels most like, uh, you know, somewhere between Next Generation and the original series. It feels like a, a very modern interpretation of it and stuff. It's And it's it's just beautiful to watch as well. Yeah, and I think they've brought in a little bit of not necessarily the timeline, but the feeling of the Abrams movies. Um, yeah, with like you know Simon Pegg and and Chris Pine and like th- that kind of like quick quick banter and stuff that's happening in yeah. Strange New Worlds. Uh, and I think they kind of bore a little bit of like you said the fun 
Um, and, yeah. and and I think it's it's definitely worth a watch for folks that even if you're not a big Star Trek fan, I don't think I mean, Alistair's brought up a lot of her like deep cuts tonight, but I don't think you need to know all that. No, no, I don't think so either. They're just nice that they're there. They, they make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> if, if that hasn't come across, I, I was very giddy and excited uh, watching this. So it's, it's been great. Moving on into the Internet Minute, which is, of course, brought to you by you, dear listener. The Citadel Cafe is 100% listener supported. If you're getting value out of the show, please consider putting a little bit of value back in. You can become a member at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member only Discord server and, of course, access to the Barista Cut bonus audio sessions. Special thanks to Bean Counter Patron Smurf588. Thanks so much for your support on this episode. Patron count is at 28. That is, I believe, steady on from last week. Our goal each week is to have one more patron than the week before. If you'd like to be patron number 29, visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. We'll see you in the Discord. I have yet another Lego pick, but I I could not ignore this today. Like this immediately came into my show notes because on June 1st, Lego is releasing optimus prime oh wow which is a creator lego set it is set 10302 worth noting that the delorean is 10300 (laughs) i'm kind of wondering if all the 80s nostalgia sets are going to be 103 something 1500 pieces of course it retails for 220 dollars canadian because why would it not it does convert from a robot to a vehicle but not only does it do that it does it much like the original toy from the 80s does, which I think was a very nice touch. I'm looking at the pictures and that is spot on. It's pretty good. Pretty much. It's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, there are 19 points of articulation, so you can pose Optimus Prime in different positions. Uh, you also have different, um, we'll say, little uh, secondary pieces, like the Matrix of Leadership is inside of his chest, and you can replace one of his hands with an Energon Axe, which is a callback to the uh, 80s, Uh, animated feature film transformers the dimensions in truck mode is over five and a half inches tall ten and a half inches long and four and a half inches wide in robot mode optimus prime stands 13 and one half inches tall so not a small piece of shelf decoration like you're gonna have to move some (laughs) lamps to fit prime in your in your living room uh, the only thing that I think is a little bit off with this is it's got something to do with his face and the shoulders. It's probably a restriction in terms of like the decals that you can put on him, but I feel like his eyes are too close together. Anything other than that looks good. Uh, but that could be just m- me remembering the cartoon. It could be re- me remembering the toy wrong. There's also been a, but a dozen different versions of Optimus Prime since then. So take your pick, but it really is a solid, solid Lego build uh, with not a lot of custom pieces. Like there's some custom wheels maybe. And even then they could be wheels from other other sets. Uh, but even his blaster, I believe, is constructed of like regular Lego blocks for the most part. So, I mean, hats off to the designers on this one. It looks really, really cool. Yeah, that's neat. So that's my pick this week. What do you have, sir? I have something unsurprisingly Star Trek related. Gasp. I know, I know. Uh, so it's from a company called Otoy who are working with the Gene Roddenberry estate to archive a ton of Gene Roddenberry's life, his legacies, creative work, just so that things are, are, are kept for posterity. And they've released a playlist on YouTube with a couple of videos going behind the scenes. And they're only like six minutes long. So they're not long at all. But they've been working with people like Denise and Mike Acuda and Doug Drexler and Darren Docterman, who are all people who've been heavily involved in the style and design of everything that you've seen over you know, the last however many decades. And... It's incredible the work that they've done. They are taking some of the model ships and scanning them. And it's not just like, oh, let's just take a 3D uh, capture of this. They're trying to get some insane photographic fidelity where they're even taking account like just the amount of light that's bouncing off of it to try and replicate just how it's illuminated. 
and then they're going in and rebuilding the interior of the ship. So there is a full 3D model of the ship that you could actually walk around. It's nuts. And then there's a lot of other stuff that they're capturing, like documents that uh, that Gene Roddenberry's son has kept over the years. There's a whole host of things. And so they've got a video that's a big behind the scenes of that. They've even got one that goes into a little bit of detail for what they're doing to capture some of the stuff from the cage. So the bridge set was slightly different and and how they might have kind of keep hold of that detail. So even as these models, if they start to wither or you know documents disappear, we have digital copies of everything. And it's it's fascinating. That sounds really, really cool. I, I can't even get over just how how detailed, like just the level that they're going to, where some of the the renderings just for the enterprise uh taking up over a hundred gigabytes of RAM just to render it. Wow. It's yeah, it's staggering. So this the, is the like a, a 3D doing. model of, of the Enterprise that you could then like virtually walk around in? Eventually, yes. And we're not even just talking just the Enterprise. They're doing everything. Wow. So pretty much every single ship, even down to there was a model for a movie that was in the works before the motion picture called Planet of the Titans. And there was a model ship for of the Enterprise for that, which looks nothing like the Enterprise, and is actually what the USS Discovery is based on. So that kind of triangular shape. They've even got that model that they've been scanning in. Uh, they, and they are taking in uh, a lot of the, like the, the drawings that were made of all the ships, uh, a lot of the production notes, just anything that you can think of, anything that they can get their hands on, they're doing. And they're even re recreating even the sets and how the ship would have been lit against a blue screen. So we've seen photos of that, but they're even just making 3D models of the shooting set with the model there and exactly how it would have looked in person. I, I just, I, I can't even get my head around just how they're, they're managing to do all this. And it's a multi-decade project. But, wow. but go check out the, the videos on YouTube. It, you, you'll be stunned. It's, it's just beautiful work and nice to know that this stuff will be preserved. In, in one form or another, and also in a way that we would never be able to, to see otherwise. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Citadel Cafe. You can get more information about the show and links to some of the things that Alistair and I talked about tonight at thecitadelcafe.com. Music for the show was composed by Kevin McLeod. You can email the show at thecitadelcafe at gmail.com or find the show by name on Twitter. Subscribe for free on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you can find a podcast, really. And word of mouth is the easiest way to support the show. Just tell a friend about the Citadel Cafe and where they can go to listen to it. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find everything I am doing online, including my illustration and design portfolio at joelduggan.com. You can listen to my other podcast all about Minecraft at thespawnchunks.com. And you can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Alistair, where can people find you online? Uh, everything about me is over at alistairmatfly.com. And I co-host two Star Trek podcasts now. First off is Long Range Sensors, which is our Star Trek retrospective series where we recently looked at the Enterprise episode Shuttlepod 1, and we also just launched Short Range Sensors, which focuses on Star Trek memorabilia, plot holes, and more. This month, we take a look at the Star Trek first-person shooter Voyager Elite Force, and if you want to find out more about both of these shows, head over to longrangesensors.com. Dude, thanks so much for being here. I would not be able to navigate these shows <laughs> with, <laughs> without some of your past knowledge because it, like so much stuff just goes over my head uh, because I, I like Trek and I've watched a lot of Trek, but I've watched them all through like once. <laughs> so when they were on, so I definitely need the refresher and having your knowledge base here is always a treat. Oh, thank you for, for having me. It's always a, a, a fun time being here. To be able to nerd out about Star Trek. I mean, I can't argue with that. You've been listening to the Citadel Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap, but you can only pick two.